the Messiah is returning. The restoration of Israel has begun. The temple of the Lord is being built, and he is already laying the foundation of this restoration, but this time with living stones. Shalom and greetings from the land of Israel. I am speaking to you from Tiberias, which is on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the place where the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, walked and taught and healed and made miracles, was blessing the people, guiding them, the people here of the Galilee, guiding them and leading them on the path, the narrow path that leads to heaven. Today we're going to be talking about a passage from the scriptures, the Word of God, the Old Testament. And I have here in front of me the original Bible in Hebrew. Um, I'll be bringing out truth. I would call them treasures, precious treasures from the Word of God. And they are treasure, precious and they're treasures because, you know, these words are words of life. These words are words that if you believe in them and store them in your heart and act on them, live according to these words, you will be victorious on your way to the kingdom of God. You know, many people today in the Christian world have uh, lost touch and contact with the Old Testament. And that's, that's really a pity. That's really, uh, you know, it's a big loss. Uh, it's time for the church worldwide to reconnect to its roots. And when I talk about the roots, I talk about the biblical roots. To reconnect to the Bible, the Old Testament, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, um, and come back to the, to the Old Testament, which the Lord has used himself to teach his disciples and to prove to them to show them that he had to be crucified, that he had to die, that he had to raise up from the dead. Um, you know, in the book of, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 24, verses 25 through 27, there we have the story of the, the two disciples. They were on their way to Emmaus, going down from Jerusalem. And it was the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. They were very nervous. They were discussing among themselves about all these things that has happened. You see, uh, like they, they were Jews and like Jews today, like my nation today, I'm a Jewish person. I'm, I'm, I'm Israeli, born here in the land. Uh, whenever we think about the Messiah, we think about him as a national redeemer, one that would come to beat down our enemies and deliver us and make Jerusalem the capital of the world and bring peace to the world. Well, that's all true, but that is all true for the second coming of the Messiah. And the disciples back then in those days had only that concept in their mind. All the time they were asking Yeshua, when are you going to bring your kingdom? And so when Yeshua died on the cross, they were all perplexed, they were confused, they, they, they just did not know how to handle it. And so on the way to a mouse, they're discussing all these things. And then on top of it, the rumors or the information and the, the witnesses of the Marias who went to the tomb and found it empty. So they were very nervous. And then all of a sudden, Yeshua appears to them, walks along their side. And then he starts opening up the word to them, it says. And he was explaining them from Moses, from the Old Testament, about all these things that had to happen. Now, where do you find these things? In the Old Testament. Obviously, the New Testament gives us the latest, the fullest, the clearest revelation. But the Old Testament holds shadows, shadows of the real thing. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Let me open it up here. Hebrews for those of you who would follow at home, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, we read the following words. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. Now, this was written to the Hebrews. 
to Jews, to Israelites. And it says the law, and they knew the law. The law holds shadows. Well, you might sit at home and say, well, why do I need a shadow if I got the real thing? Well, let me tell you, some of these shadows, or many of them, are still prophetic. And you definitely want to hold on to them and to study them because not all of them have been fulfilled and they're very relevant, even for today. Not only that, but also these shadows, these pictures, these parables bring home in a good and clear way, they bring home truth which are, which are vitally important for us. You know, they say that uh, one picture is worth a thousand words. And so you have pictures here in the Old Testament. Today, we're going to be looking at one of these pictures and reveal the secrets and the shadows that this picture contains. What is the significance? What does it all mean? Well, we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 17, and I'll be reading out verses 8 to 16. That's the story of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Um, they were about um, over two months on their way, and they're coming to this place, Refidim. And here comes against them an enemy, the Amalekite, and a battle develops, breaks loose. Now this is the story of the battle as we would find it. Exodus chapter 17 from verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hu went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' and hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hu held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up on the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Let's look now at the background of this story and let's find out the secret of the victory. And that secret, let me tell you in advance, holds a very vital, important message for us because we are all, whether we recognize it or not, we are engaged in a battle. And when we say we, I talk about every person, every man and every woman that has chosen to believe in Yeshua and is on her or his way to heaven. On the narrow path, there is a battle that is waging. And this passage reveals to us the secret of the victory. Now let's look at the background. The children of Israel just came out of Egypt. It was a very marvelous experience. God was smiting the Egyptians. And after the 10th plague, the last one, they set on their way out. Uh, they crossed the Reed Sea, and while the Egyptians were coming after them, they were all drowned there. And now there were a few weeks, several weeks on their way, moving from one place to another in the desert. Now, in the passage before that battle is described, we have the story of Massa and Meriva. And he tells us in the verse, uh, chapter 17 from verse 1 and onward, he tells us that they have arrived to this place and found no water. No water. That was in a place called Refidim. I spent myself three and a half years in this desert of Sinai, very close to this place of Refidim. 
So they had no water. Now you can understand people in the desert had not having any water, that becomes a critical need and obviously you cannot survive too long without water. The problem is not that a normal person will get worried and concerned if he's in a place without water in the desert. He knows he's going to die unless he gets some water to drink. The problem though was in this situation that they were not alone. They were being led by God himself who walked before them in the pillar, in the cloud, day and night. They have seen his mighty hand again and again already at that stage. They have seen him providing for them. They have seen him providing manna coming down from heaven. And yet when they came to this situation, they started complaining. As a matter of fact, they were complaining to Moses, why have you brought me out of Egypt to kill me, my son, and my sheep and goats? And actually Moses is crying out here to God and says, this nation is almost stoning me. So you can picture this, this situation of them becoming sweaty, hot, angry, violent, and almost losing it to the point of wanting to stone Moses to death. Now, let me tell you, this is a very poor spiritual situation to be in. It shows the weakness of my nation, of our fathers in the desert. They should have trusted God. They've seen so many miracles already at that stage that they should have had enough faith in them to trust God that He is with them and that He's going to provide their needs. But they did not. So God then tells Moses to go out and strike the rock and water came, would come out, and indeed it has happened. And in verse 7 it says that this place was called Massa and Merivah. And that means in Hebrew, the meaning of it is, they have tried me, Massa, Nasotam, et Adonai. They have tried God, they have tested God. They said, is God in our midst? Of course he was in their midst. They should have not asked this question, but they did. And that was a sin. And Merivah, they were quarreling with God. They were quarreling with Moses. And that was a sin. Yet God provided water for them. Now the point is that this story reveals to us their spiritual weakness. And you know, when a nation is weak militarily, it would invite a military attack by the enemy. But when a nation or a person are weak spiritually, it would invite an attack from the spiritual enemy, the devil, the powers of darkness. And so right after that story of that complaining, all of a sudden, we find the Amalekites coming to fight the nation of Israel right there in the desert of Rephidim. Now, as we go into the story, we will come into uh, points where you would see that the English translation or whatever translations you're reading and following in your, uh, at home, you'll find that there are discrepancies, there are problems in the translations. And that's really a pity because it blurs the picture. It, it hides away. It covers like with a layer of dust the truth and the treasures that are hidden in there. But we have before us here the original text and we'll go straight to the original text and bring out the, these treasures, these truths. Um, <clears throat> We're going to, first of all, explain what really has happened here. We need to pay attention to the details. Moses tells Joshua, as they see the Amalekites, they were approaching, they saw them, they knew tomorrow there will be the battle. So he tells Moses, Moses tells Joshua in verse 9, tomorrow... I will go up on the hill, on top of the hill, and he says, the rod of God, the staff of God, the banner of God, whatever you want to call it, the pole of God, some translation would say, would be in my hands. 
Now, usually when you uh, open up a children's Bible and you look at the picture that uh, describes that battle, you would see Moses um, sitting on a rock with his hands up like that and Aaron and Hul supporting his hands from both sides and there would be no rod often or the rod would be pictured laying along his side on the ground. However, it's very important to notice in verse 9 that Moses says, the rod of God will be in my hand. So then Joshua obeys and he does as Moses tells him. And while he's setting up the soldiers, the army, the Israelites, setting them up down below at the valley, at the plateau, Moses, Aaron, and Hu climb up unnoticed. Nobody pays attention to them. Just three little figures climbing up on the hill. Militarily, you'd say totally insignificant. But in this case, they were the key for the defeat of the Amalekites, as we will see in a moment. And so let's see what has happened here. Moses, we have your Moses with us, and I will invite him. Please come and stand here. Moshe, bevakasha tavo, vetarim et amate. And show us how Moses raised up the staff. Here is Moses, and here is the staff of God, a shepherd's staff. Let us remember that Moses was a shepherd for 40 years prior to taking the Israelites out of Egypt. So here is our Moses, modern day Moses, with a staff. And how long can you hold up the hands? So he was getting tired. Now it says whenever his hands went down, the powers of darkness, the black guys, the Amalekites, were beating the Israelites down. And whenever his hands were up, the Israelites were winning. They had the upper hand. So Moses was keeping holding his hands up like that, but obviously, as you can imagine, he was getting tired and his hands were coming down. And so Aaron and Hu, who stand next to him, moved into action. They brought a rock and they put the rock under him and they sat him on the rock. And then they supported his hands, raising them high up. And they held his hands like that all the day, all the day, till evening, till the sun was going down. And during this time, Joshua was fighting and was defeating the Amalekites, defeating them by the sword. It says here, after that battle, that Moses built up an altar and called it, God is my banner. And you see, Moses was holding up a rod. So you can understand that after a long day that he was holding up the rod like that up, he goes, builds a banner, uh, builds an altar and calls it, God is my banner. Let's pay attention to this little detail and later on we'll open up and see what it all means. So we already get the picture that the secret, the key to the victory in this battle was in this little movement. Hands down, hands down, Amalekites, the powers of darkness, the enemies defeating the chosen nation of God. Hands up, the Israelites are winning. What does it mean? What's the secret? Is this a shadow? Yes, it is a shadow of some spiritual reality which we need to discover and find out because we ourselves are on a battle as we're moving on as to the kingdom of heaven. You see, the children of Israel were on their way to the promised land of Canaan. And we're also moving on to the heavenly Jerusalem. So we will say thank you now to Moses and Joshua, and they can go. Thank you. I'll keep the rod here. We'll need it as we move on. 
At the end of this passage, there is also a revelation that Moses receives from heaven. The meaning of that revelation we will discuss as we come to the end of this series. So, what is the message in all of it? Let's, let's look back for a moment. You know, the New Testament reveals to us that all the story, everything that happened with the children of Israel um, happened so that we will benefit from it. it. It's being told, it's being recorded, it has been documented, not just for the sake of history, but it has a message for every one of us here and today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, it says, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. There is a great parallel between the children of Israel and every believer from every nation that has come to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and in his Messiah, Yeshua, the son of David, born to the tribe of Judah in Bethlehem, according to the prophecies of the prophets of all times. Daniel prophesied that the Messiah should have come uh, at the time of the end of the second temple. He described in chapter 9, he prophesied that the Messiah will be cut off and later on the temple and the city will be destroyed by a mighty and strong nation. And all of that has happened 2,000 years ago when Yeshua, Jesus, was born, walked in this land of Israel, fulfilled all of these and many other prophecies, was crucified for our sins, died, was buried, but he rose up on the third day and went up to heaven. So, you see, they, the children of Israel, were slaves in Egypt. Egypt is a picture of this world with its sinfulness. Every one of us, before coming to faith in Yeshua and before giving our lives to God, we were slaves, slaves to sin. They came out of Egypt, they were saved, and we have been saved. We have been broken loose from slavery to sin. They were delivered and protected by the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, which was put on the doorpost of their house. And we have been protected and delivered by the blood of Yeshua, the Messiah. His blood was also shed as he was hanging on the cross. It's very interesting that uh, um, blood was applied on certain points at the frames of the door of each house uh, of the Israelites. On the two sides, on the upper part of the door, and the lamb itself was slain on the thresh floor of the door. The blood was poured down on what is called in Hebrew saf. And saf is the thresh floor. It's also a cup. But that verse of Exodus chapter 12 describes all four sides of the door. All four sides of the door in the Hebrew language. Mezuzot and the mashkof and saf. And mezuzot are the two sides, and mashkof is the upper part, and saf is the lower part. And so the blood was applied exactly on the points of the cross, the two sides of the door of the entrance. They described the two nails that were driven in Yeshua's hands. The blood on the upper part of the door describes the throne of thorns which was beaten into Yeshua's head as he was hanging on the cross. He was bleeding from his head. He was bleeding from his hands. And he was bleeding from his feet as a nail was driven into his feet. And so you have the four points of the blood and the four points of the cross symbolized already back in Egypt over a thousand years, nearly a thousand, uh, 400 years before Jesus actually died on the cross. So you see all of this parable. They came out from Egypt and went through the Reed Sea. 
and we are coming out of slavery and are being baptized also in water. They went through the desert, they wandered for 40 years, and we wander through the desert of this world. And let me tell you, this world is a spiritual desert. And we're wandering as well all of our lives. They were on the way to the land of Canaan, and we are on our way to heavenly Jerusalem, as we have said before. They had the rock walking with them. You know, the rock appears more than once. Here we read, just uh, in this chapter of uh, Exodus chapter 17, we read about water coming out of the rock, and the New Testament reveals us that this rock was the Messiah. You see, Yeshua, when he was smitten on the cross, when he died, out of his death came life for whoever will believe in him. Let me tell you, true life is not what we have today in this world, that what it offers. True life is not just eating and drinking and, and enjoying the pleasures of this flesh. True life is being to connect, means to be connected to the source of life. And the source of life is God. From Him all lives originate. And when you receive forgiveness of your sins through the blood and sacrifice of Yeshua that died for you, you're reconnected with the source of life, with the living God. So Yeshua was the rock. Life came from Him as living water came out of the rock for the children of Israel to drink and to live. So we see a lot of parallel, and believe me, there is a lot more, but we need to move on. So they were on their way to the Promised Land. You see, the powers of darkness, the Egyptian army was trying to hold them back. Like the devil will try to hold every one of us back from making it to heaven. You know, the devil does not want any one person to hear the truth about Yeshua and come to faith. Because once you come to faith in Yeshua, he has lost you. You're out of his prison. You're away from being a slave to, his, to the sins which are in you and around you. The devil does not want anyone to come to a saving knowledge of Yeshua. So he's trying to keep this away. And he does many different tricks. One of them is to create religions. You know, religions claim to be presenting God. Christian religion claims to be presenting Jesus. But actually, they're presenting a major stumbling block in the, before the feet of many people who want to come to the true living God, but they're coming into a church building and they find their statues and pictures and candles and incense and all kinds of stuff which God has not even commanded. And so they think they're coming to God, but they're not. They're coming to a building. God wants us to come to Him, and He's a living God. When we come to true faith in Yeshua, we're connecting to the living God. So the Egyptians failed. Their power was broken in the Red Sea. And let me tell you, everyone who comes to faith in Yeshua is commanded in the New Testament to be baptized. Baptism was a Jewish ceremony. John the Baptist was a Jew. And it had to do with confessing your sins and being cleansed. And so the nation of Israel went through the Red Sea, which is a picture of the baptism, which every one of us does. And when you have come to a, a faith, to a saving knowledge of Yeshua, and you've taken this first step of obedience and have been baptized, then you are out. You're on your way now to heaven. You're broken away. You're broken loose from the prison. But this is not the end of the story, because if the devil cannot hold you in slavery, he will try to stop you from making it to the promised land. And that's where the Amalekites come in. And that's where the battle for each one of us comes in. We're on our way. We're pilgrims on the narrow path that leads up to heaven. But the battle is surely going to confront us. And we will have to overcome. Each and every single man and woman will have to overcome that battle. But how? How did the Israelite overcome? What was the secret that the Word of God is holding in this picture for us? We already said, Moses said, the staff, the rod of God will be in my hand. And we have already seen when the rod was up, 
the children of Israel were winning, when the rod was down, the Amalekites were winning. And the Hebrew passage, I remember years ago when I was reading that passage, I came to verse 12. Now, in a very free translation here, let me, from the Hebrew text, let me just spontaneously, very freely here, give you this uh, translation. And the hands of Moses were heavy, and so they took a stone, they put it under him, he sat on it, and Aaron and Chul supported his hands, one from each side, and now listen to that, in the Hebrew it says, and his hands were emunah. The Hebrew word here that comes is, and his hands were emunah. Till the coming down of the sun. What is the meaning of this word emunah? In order to see this, we will now take a look at the slide. Okay, so here we have now before us a slide with verse 12 in Hebrew, the second part of verse 12. And it says here, now please note that Hebrew goes from right to left, okay? We, we have it the right way. Let me say it was before English, okay? So we got it the right way, okay? From right to left. And it says, Vayihi yadav emunah. This word emunah is a key word which will, I'll explain in a moment. Vayihi yadav emunah ad bo hashemesh. And it means, and his hands, in English it would say, were steady until the going down of the sun. Were steady. The Hebrew word emunah, which you see written in red above, has got two meanings. In the physical realm, yes, you can say his hands were steady. But the first meaning of this word emunah is faith. It has got a spiritual meaning. Faith. His hands were faith. And when you get the spiritual meaning of this word, you see in the Hebrew you have a word, and this word may have such a wide angle of meaning, okay? In this case, let's say a munah would have on the one side of it the physical meaning, they were steady, and the spiritual side, the next half, it would mean faith. The same word, emuna. In English, the translators don't have a word that parallels to the Hebrew word. So they either choose the physical meaning and they say it was steady, or they would choose the spiritual meaning and they would say his hands were faith. But no place do you find them saying that his hands were steady faith. But that's really what it means. That's what the Hebrew original word means. His hands were faith. So the beauty here, you get the physical meaning. They were held strong. They were held steady by Aaron and Hu. But you have a key that is being placed and before you. His hands were faith. And when you think about it, faith up, that means strong faith, the children of Israel are winning. When faith or hands are growing tired and weak and they're coming down, the powers of darkness are winning. Faith up, the children of God, the chosen nation, the Israelites are winning. That all of a sudden brings in a whole new dimension and it brings home to us that the staff of Moses turned into a banner in his hands. You see, the hands of faith were not empty hands. They were not just like that. Moses was not going like that. In some pictures, you may find him going like that. No. You don't hold a banner like that. You see, banner, the concept of a banner is that you lift it up so that it is being seen. And in battle, banners would be lifted up, like the Roman banner would have an eagle on it, and the soldiers would, when they heard the, the battle cry, or they would hear the trumpet, or whatever the sign was, they would look for the banner, and the banner holder would have to raise it up high, 
So they would identify it and they would rally and regroup themselves under the banner. So the banner had to be lifted up. Now, Moses was holding this banner. His hands are faith. And as I said, it was not empty faith. It was not faith that was holding on to the air. It was faith holding on to something, to the rod, to a banner. What does this rod signify? What does this banner signify spiritually? It signifies the cross of Yeshua. And you say, wow, what a jump you've made now. What a leap. You need to prove this to us. We want to see how in the world did you come to such a wild conclusion. Moses holding a rod and you're saying this is a picture of the cross of Jesus. Come on with you. Well, come on with you. Let's go for it. <laughs> okay. How do I prove this? Well, in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, you know, just before the very famous John chapter 3, verse 16, comes these two verses. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Then comes the next verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So just before that major message of salvation of the Gospels, Jesus makes a comparison of His cross, the cross on which He was lifted up, and He compares it to a story which we find in the book of Numbers. Chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. And in this place in Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9, we have the story again of the children of Israel complaining to God, and God sent a serpent, and they were biting them, and many thousands were being uh, killed by the poison of the serpents. And as the nation was crying out now to God and to Moses to help them, God tells Moses, make a banner. And put on this banner a serpent, a brazen serpent. Let's read that now. Numbers chapter 21. Let's see the original, okay? Numbers chapter 21. Here it is. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Now, please note that English says pole, while the Hebrew uses the word ness. And ness is the same word that was used in the story of Moses sitting on the rock and raising up the banner. So the English says pole, but it means banner. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a frozen snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the frozen snake, he lived. What a wonderful picture. What a wonderful comparison that Jesus is giving us here. His cross is compared to that story of that frozen altar. And just as back in the days of Moses, whoever looked at this frozen serpent received life, was saved from the deadly poison, so also today, whoever looks at Yeshua, Whoever believes in the sacrifice that the Lord has made on the cross, on that banner where He sacrificed Himself, whoever believes, looks at Him with eyes of faith, He will receive forgiveness of sins. The poison, the deadly poison that would eventually take people down to hell, to eternal judgment and punishment, that poison is being neutralized, is being taken away. The person receives not just life here on earth, but eternal life in heaven. <clears throat> so Mo Jesus calls his cross a ness, a banner. So we have here a series of, of uh, pictures, three pictures of the cross, three shadows, and each one of these pictures 
is adding more information and another aspect of the real thing, which is Yeshua on the cross, Jesus on the cross. Let's take a look now at these pictures. Taviri. Okay, the first picture that we see up here is the picture of Moses sitting on a rock with hands of faith and he's holding up the banner. Second picture that we see, and I'll explain in a moment, is the altar that he builds right after the battle and he calls it, God is my banner. The third picture we've talked about briefly is the pole, the banner which Moses made. Now a serpent is a picture of sin. You know, the devil entered into a serpent in the Garden of Eden when he misled Adam and Eve. So serpents since that time are a picture, they symbolize sinfulness. And Yeshua, when he hung on the cross, he took upon himself my sin. He took upon himself your sin, our sinfulness. He became sin for us. He became evil for us, so to speak. Our evilness, our defilement, uncleanliness, all of it, our corruption, all of it fell on him. So here's the picture of the serpent on the cross. But then you have this picture, the altar which Moses built. And in this altar, in this picture, we have three components. We have an altar, and we have the word God, and we have the word Ness. Ness is a banner. This is the same word which repeats itself in all of these biblical Old Testament pictures. So three concepts, you see, the new dimension that this picture gives us is twofold. One, that God is on this banner. You see, God is my banner. It's not a Roman eagle that was on the banner. It's not some kind of a flag, a lion, or who knows what, a Magen David, or something else. No, God is my banner. You see, when Moses held up his banner, there was nothing hanging on there. It was just a piece of wood. But Moses says, you know what? God is my banner. Why? Because one day when Jesus will be hanging on the cross, he is God that came in flesh to die on earth for our sins. You see, he had to come down on earth and put on himself the clothing of a person so that he can identify and become one of us and die for us. He had to walk the path from baby back to all the way to adulthood and go this way without sinning. And then when he died on the cross, he didn't die because of his own sins. He died because of our sins. He paid for us. So God is my banner. So this picture reveals to us that God is on my banner and it reveals to us that the banner is going to be an altar. An altar. The cross was the altar on which Yeshua sacrificed himself. And then we have the last picture, which is the picture of our message today. The hands of faith. If you want to benefit from the cross, if you want to benefit from the sacrifice which God has provided for you as a person, the only way that you can benefit is if you take hold of it with faith, faith, believing. When you say, God, I believe in you. I believe there is a God in heaven. I don't believe that this world was created by nothing, by some kind of an explosion and accumulation of dust and who knows what. No, I believe in you, God. I believe that you have created. I believe that you exist. I believe that one day I'll stand before you and give account over my life. And God, I know because your word tells me so that I am a sinner. Lord, I believe in you. And not only do I believe in you, that you're holy and perfect. I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I believe that you have sent Yeshua, your son, to die on the cross for my sins. I believe and I accept now your forgiveness. I accept your atonement with hands of faith. I hold on to it. You don't need to hold on to a piece of wood. You don't have to hold in your hand a cross. No, 
You have to hold it in your heart. You have to believe in it in your heart. And then you will receive life. You will receive life. And not only life, in this way that we are walking as individuals on the narrow path that is leading up to heaven, as you confront the powers of darkness that are trying to hinder you, they're trying to accuse you, they're trying to blame you, they're trying to put you down, they're trying to put doubts in your, in your way. They're, they might bring sickness, there might be car accident, there might be earthquakes, there might be who knows what economical crisis, there might be all kinds of problems, regardless of what it is that they throw at you. You can always hold on and say, I believe in God. He is my Redeemer. In the name of Jesus, devil, depart from me. You have no right over my life. I have been purchased by the precious blood of a perfect sacrifice. The Son of God, Yeshua, who died on the cross for me. And I hold on to Him in faith. Whoever looks on Yeshua shall receive salvation. Whoever holds on to Him in faith, he shall be saved. What a wonderful revelation. What a wonderful picture. On the cross of Yeshua, we do not just have forgiveness of sins. We have the freedom being set free from curses because when Yeshua died on the cross, He was made curse for us. He took upon Himself our sicknesses so that we might be healed. He took upon Himself poverty that we might have the provision of God. There is an exchange that took place on the cross and that exchange in it, Yeshua took on Himself everything which is bad and evil and made provision for us by the grace of God to this which is good and brings life. We need to learn to apply it in our lives. We need to learn to hold on to the perfect work of Yeshua on the cross, believe in it. And all of this is found in the law of Moses. What a revelation, what a treasure. What a wonderful picture that we have here of the cross of Yeshua and the full provision which God has provided for us. We need to learn to implement this provision in our lives. And this is tricky. This is tricky. You see, let, let's take a look at everything that we can benefit, everything we can draw out, everything and, and much more that could be a message of an hour all by itself. First of all, Yeshua on the cross took upon Himself our sins. You know, we read this in Isaiah chapter 53. The whole chapter talks about this man who dies for our sins. He is innocent. He hasn't done any evil. He hasn't done any wrong. And yet God chooses him and lays on him our sins. So when we as individuals, as we walk through life, if we have fallen, if we have failed, and the enemy comes and he accuses us and says, you are bad, you have fallen. We have the privilege of coming before our God, confessing our sins, asking forgiveness because of the atonement, the sacrifice of Yeshua, and then getting up back on our spiritual legs and moving onward, fighting the enemy. So this is good and mighty weapon against accusation, against condemnation, that wants to put us down and leave us down. We can raise up, we can overcome. This in, in this cross that we're holding on to with our hands of faith, we have provision over our sicknesses because it also says that He took our sicknesses upon Him. By His wounds, by His stripes, we are healed when we're being beaten, when we are, God forbid, in some accidents and we, we suffer physical injuries our, ourselves or others around us. We can come and hold on to the cross of Yeshua. We can proclaim the victory and the healing that He has provided for us when He died. It is all, can only be taken, grabbed hold of with hands of faith. 
If we are facing curses, curses that came from our uh, previous generations, our parents, our grandparents, or even before that, you know, in Yeshua, we're set free from the curses because it says that He was made a curse for us as He hung on the tree. So we don't have to remain under any kind of, of a curse. We do not have that. And the Bible describes what are curses. We've met, I've met people that, that could not have any children. They kept aborting their children. They kept losing them or either they could enter into pregnancy. Sometimes it was cases that went to their parents and grandparents, a history of problems with childbearing. Well, that's a curse according to the Bible. You break it in the name of Jesus. You come against it. And we've seen case after case where people all of a sudden then became pregnant, entered into pregnancy and enjoyed the blessing of having children. And so with poverty, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he was naked. He lost everything. They took away his clothing. Even the grave he was put in was not his. It was the full picture of total poverty. He took on himself poverty. We do not have to stay in poverty. And I'm not teaching here a gospel of prosperity, but God does provide for his children. And we should have what we need for our life. And so if we are facing situations where again and again everything we do fails, we need to come before God. We need to hold on to Yeshua. We need to proclaim what He has provided for us. We need to not just give in and keep on living our lives under any kind of a curse. There is so much provision that we need to learn to implement all by faith, holding on with hands of faith. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, we read the following words. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, we are engaged in a battle and the victory, the overcoming in this battle has got to do with faith, holding on to faith in Yeshua, in Jesus. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God, we will overcome. The battle of the Israelites against the Amalekites was not war, uh, won primarily by Joshua. Yes, he had to go down there. Yes, he had to fight. But it was Moses up on the hill holding up hands of faith that really was the key to victory. And so in our lives, yes, we have to do our part in the physical realm. Yes, we have to work. We have to use our logic. We have to do what we can as human beings, but we have to recognize that all of our efforts are totally inadequate. But if we add to it faith in God, then we shall succeed. This is the key, the victory. <clears throat> now, let me say that this picture of the banner and the hands of faith repeats itself not just in the story we've just read, but in other places. In it, in it also has future implementation. Let's take a look, for example, in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10. Isaiah chapter 11. This is a prophecy for days yet to come. It says, In that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. This is a time that is yet to come, the millennial kingdom of God. Who is this root of Jesse? Well, in Revelation, we read that the root of Jesse is Yeshua, Jesus. This is in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Jesus speaks of himself as the root of Jesse the root of David. Jesse was the father of David. And so this passage in Isaiah talks about the time that Yeshua will stand as a banner. He will stand in Jerusalem. He will be the king. Hallelujah. Our king is reigning. Our king will reign. 
all the powers of darkness and all of the powers of Islam who want to rule this world, I tell you here in the name of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you will not rule this world. It is Yeshua that will rule this world. That's what the Bible says. And the time will come when all nations will rally around Jesse. He will be a banner. They will rally around him from all four corners of the world. People will flow to Jerusalem. They will come to the holy mountain of God. They will come to hear his teaching. The law, which means the teaching of God, will come out of Zion to all nations. And hallelujah, it is starting in a very small measure to come out also already today. So, <clears throat> Yeshua is a banner and will be a banner. He died on a banner. He is a banner. He will remain a banner for all people to rally around him. And look also in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19, we read the following. This is the King James Version. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Hebrew word for this word standard is again banner. It's the same word ness in Hebrew that repeats itself in all of these passages and shows us the continuity, the continuity of the same thought in all of them. When the enemy comes in like a flood, and let me tell you, Antichrist, when he collects all of his armies and he comes into this land in the future, which is yet before us, yes? He will be coming in like a flood. He is described like a river. But there will be one thing that the Spirit of God will raise against him. It's the banner. It is the victory of Yeshua on the cross. And whoever would hold on in these difficult future days, whoever will hold on to Yeshua, to his faith, and will not let go, he will overcome the enemy. Hallelujah. He will overcome. We have an assured victory because Yeshua won already the battle on the cross 2,000 years ago. He won the battle against death as he broke loose and rose up from the death. Death could not hold Jesus down in Sheol. He overcame the power of death. And so we have the victory, but we need to hold on to this victory and not let go. Dear ones, let me tell you, we are engaged in a battle. In Ephesians chapter 6, we have the armor, the spiritual armor that is given to us, provided for us to overcome. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, we're being challenged. We're being called to wake up, to be sober, because our enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion going around us, seeking whom he can devour. And we're being told to stand against him. How? Strong in faith. Stand against him strong in faith. Knowing that our brethren in the past have gone through tremendous tortures and problems and sufferings, and they overcame. And so also we, if we hold on to Yeshua, we are overcomers with him. What an important message for these days. As the powers of darkness are gaining territory, as the world is falling further and further, deeper and deeper into sin, we're living in the time of the great apostasy, which Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where people, humanity, and mainly the Western humanity that used to be Christian, has fallen away, has departed from the love of the truth, have left the love to the Word of God. And now Europe, and also in the United States, more and more, the powers of darkness are taking control. Islam is raging and, and gaining. In Europe, churches are closing down and moshes are being built up. But hallelujah, I stand here today and I say, Jesus is victorious. We know the end of the battle. We know the victory. The victory is His. Hallelujah. And so we want to learn to hold on and be encouraged to hold on to the end and not let go. 
Now, back to this passage, back to the picture of Exodus. We find that as Moses was tired, they took a rock and they set him on the rock. Here is this chair presenting the rock which Moses was seated on. What is this stone? What is this rock? Well, in the Bible, again and again, we read about the rock of our salvation. We read about the cornerstone, the foundation stone. All of these pictures are pointing to one and only one, to Yeshua, to the Messiah, to the stone which the builders have rejected. And yet God chose him and made him the chief stone, the cornerstone, the prettiest stone of the house. You know, these builders were the religious authority of the nation of Israel 2,000 years ago. They have rejected Yeshua. My people, my nation has not accepted him. We have rejected him. And yet God has chosen this one that for us is an, has been an outcast. God has chosen him and has raised him up. And when he comes again and we see him, we will recognize, actually before he comes, God is going to open up our eyes as Israel, as a Jewish nation, and we shall recognize that this one, this Jesus, this rock, he is our brother. Now we want to go back to the picture of Exodus chapter 17. We have the rock. Here is this chair symbolizing the rock. The rock on which Aaron and Hur set Moses down. What does this rock symbolize? This rock also symbolizes actually the Lord, Yeshua. You see, in the Bible, in the Psalms, in different places, he is called the rock of our salvation. And in Hebrew, it's, it sounds Tzur Yeshuati. You know, the word, the meaning of the name of Yeshua, Jesus, is salvation. Yeshua. Yeshuati. When you hear it in Hebrew, you can see the, the great simil uh, similarity. Yeshua and Yeshuati. Tzur Yeshuati, the rock of my salvation. So whenever you find rock, whenever you find stone, you immediately are starting to think about the rock of the salvation, which is the Messiah, which is Yeshua. It is interesting that in the Psalms it also says that the rock which the builders have rejected, God has taken and has put to be the chief, the corner store, the most important stone, the most beautiful stone of the building. And again, this is a messianic uh, psalm speaking about the Messiah. The builders were the religious authorities, the religious leaders of Israel 2,000 years ago. They have rejected Yeshua. The nation, the multitudes were going after him. They were crying out, Hoshana le Ben David. They, they were blessed by him. They loved him. They wanted to hear his teaching. They were blessed by his healings and by his love, by feeding them with the fish and the loaves of bread, by raising the dead, by telling them that there is hope, that you can arrive into heaven, that God will accept you, and that you don't have to put on yourself this yoke, this tremendous yoke of orders and commandments which men have made and which God has never commanded on the household of Israel. Jesus came, Yeshua came to the nation and said, yes, God wants you, poor, miserable people, that nobody looks at you, that you're the outcast. Come to me, all you that are burdened and labored. And yet, the religious authorities rejected him. And they handed him over to the Romans. Yes, we were the enlightened nation. We had the law. We had the prophets. We had the Bible. We had the covenants. From us came the fathers and the prophets. And, and everything that humanity got, God gave to humanity through this nation. And so it is a big failure on our part that we have rejected God's plan of salvation for us. However, it was the Romans that nailed him to the cross. And so it is not just one or the other that is at fault. Yeshua died for all of us and because of all of us, the Jew and the Gentile together. He died for our, for my sin as a Jew, first of all, and for your sin, wherever you're coming from, Africa or China or America or regardless. 
He died by both of us, Jew and Gentile, and He died for both of us, Jew and Gentile. So He is the rock. You know, in the Psalms it says, this is a wonderful thing for us. Niflat, hi niflat benenu. We don't understand it. That's what it means. It's like a wonder. It's a miracle. It's something that we don't understand. This is Psalm 118 from verse 20 to 23. And in verse 23 it says, this is from God. It's wonder. It's something we do not comprehend. Until this day, we here in Israel, my nation, the religious authorities do not understand this wonder. You know, it's like the brothers of Joseph. When they came to Egypt, they did not recognize that Joseph was their brother. They thought he is an Egyptian. He's a Gentile. He's a foreigner. And they did not know that he is their brother who waited for them and who loved them and who wanted to provide for them and who did save them, save Jacob, saved Israel and all of his descendants. This is Yeshua. Joseph is another picture of Yeshua. So the stone, the rock, and there are many more pictures of it pointing to Yeshua, is a picture of the Lord. Now what does it mean to us? It means that even if we as human beings are walking the narrow path of life and we're facing a challenge, and we have to hold on with hands of faith and raise up our hands over a period of time. And oh, it is tiring. I might be praying for the, my grandchild who is, who is sick or, or for my son and I want him to be saved and I'm crying out to God and I'm proclaiming the Word of God. And it takes days and weeks and maybe months and maybe years and I'm growing tired. And I'm thinking, God, I'm doing all the work here of raising up this banner. And God says, no, my son. Oh, yes, I do expect you to use your faith, to, to, to stretch to the limits your muscles of faith. But my son, I want you to know that while you think that you're carrying the burden, it is really me who is carrying you, most of your body is on the rock and I am undergirding you. I am behind you. I am carrying your weight. That's the message that this rock gives to us. We are in the hand of our Heavenly Father. God, we're in His hands and He will carry us through the battle. But that's not the end. I would invite Moses and Joshua and, and Aaron and Chul to come back again and sit. Tishvu, tachziku, tarim et adayim, ve tachziku lo adayim. You see, we talked about the hands of Moses being faith. But what about the hands of Aaron? What about the hands of Chul? They were all pulling their muscles together. You see, even a mighty man of God like Moses, in certain situations, certain battles, it becomes too much for one man. It, it seems like it becomes too much for the faith of one man, even if he's a godly man. And it takes the combination of hands pulling together. How many hands do we have here? Two hands of Aaron, two hands of Moses, two hands of Chul. Six hands put together. Six is the number of person. Six hands put together. Hands, faith coming together. Let's take a look in Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. And let's see the reality of this picture presented to us by our Lord Yeshua Himself. He talks to us about the times when we need to combine our faith and become one heart in our battle, in our struggles. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, Yeshua says, I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you, now pay attention, 
If two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. If two of you agree, this is the agreement. If two of you come in agreement of faith and you say, God, we pray for this need. God, we pray for this situation. We agree together before you, Father. If any one of you agree, you can bind. Anything you bind in heaven shall be bound on earth. Of well, what heaven is Yeshua talking about? It's the second heaven where the devil is with all of his powers of darkness. You know, today the devil is not operating from Sheol. He's not operating from down under the earth. He is not in hell. He is in the second heavens. That's from there, from this place, he's sending out his powers of darkness. In Revelation, we found our Michael and, and his angels are pushing down the devil down to earth. From, they're coming out from the third heaven. They're pushing the devil down from the second heaven down to earth. So Yeshua is saying, if you combine your faith together here on earth, Whatever you bind here on earth shall be bound in these second heavens. If the devil has a plan to come against a fellowship, he's got a plan to break it apart, to bring division. And the saints of God unite together in faith and they come against it and they say, we nullify this plan. We stand against it in the name of Jesus. We bind it in the name of Jesus. You intercede for your leaders. You intercede for your fellow congregants. You can break, you can stop, you can hinder the work of the enemy. Combine your faith together. Com put your hands of faith together and you will be irresistible. There will be no power that can resist you. And after two are together, here we had three men standing together with Moses, combining their hands of faith. And the victory was granted unto them. The victory against Amalek. Thank you. Todalachem. <clears throat> Dear ones, we need to take another look at Amalek, at this enemy that we're fighting against. It's worth paying attention. There is a whole study about the tactics of Amalek, the tactics of this evil enemy. You see, God says, I will blot him out from under heaven. There will be nothing left of Amalek. After this defeat that Amalek suffered from the hands of Joshua and the nation of Israel, we don't find him anymore coming and confronting the children of Israel in open battle. But from that point on, we find Amalek doing something which was very bad and very evil in the eyes of God. We read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 through 19. We read how Amalek now came from behind against those of the children of Israel that were lingering behind the camp. Let me read this for you. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he is given, giving you, to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So what did the Amalekites do? They came from behind. Whom did they attack? They attacked those that were lingering behind. Dear ones, the household of Israel are the chosen people of God in the flesh here on earth. We still are the chosen people of God. God is still faithful to the covenants that he has made with Israel and to every promise he has made to us as a nation. However, we've already seen that Israel is also a picture of, of every child of God that has been called and chosen by God and that has accepted faith in Yeshua and has joined the path, the narrow path that leads to heaven. And so there is a message for us here. 
You see, what was the problem with those that were lingering behind in the camp of Israel? We read in the Bible that many, many times along these 40 years of wandering in the desert, the children of Israel complained against God. They were stricken with this uh, sickness and with a sin of complaining, of murmuring, of coming against God and against Moses again and again. Several times we, our fathers, almost stoned Moses to death. We've seen in Exodus 17 just one of these cases, but it was not the only one. And so when the pillar would raise up over the tabernacle of God in the wilderness, it was signed for the Israelites, for all 12 tribes, to pull down their tents and get ready for the march. Those among the children of Israel who were disobedient, those that were murmuring, those that were complaining, when everybody else was taking apart their tent or their tabernacles, then they were the ones that were lagging behind. Oh, again, we have to move. We're sick and tired of this desert. How long are we going to continue marching here in this dust and heat? When are we going to finally make it to the promised land of Canaan? We're sick and tired of it all. Can you identify with this kind of an attitude? Does it sound familiar in your life at times when you get sick and tired and you want to kick and shove and push everything off of you? Well, these were the people that when everybody else were pulling down, they were lagging behind, they were dragging their feet, they were murmuring, they were unhappy. And so when the camp was now ready to move, they were still packing their stuff. And when everybody now was moving and, and marching, they were lagging, they were behind. Wrapped up everything and then followed. These were the ones which the Amalekites attacked. Amalekites would come from behind. They would ambush. They would launch surprise attacks on the, these tribes from behind. And they would be killing those that were from behind. These people that were from the Israelites that were behind, they were tired, they were weary, and they did not have the fear of God. Some translation indicate that the Amalekites did not have the fear of God. Well, obviously the Amalekites had no fear of God. They were resisting him. The problem was that those that were lingering behind did not have the fear of God as well. And they became uh, prey to the Amalekites. Dear ones, here is the message for us today. Be careful from complaining against God. Be careful of it. Complaining is a sin. Thank God for everything you have. Whether it looks difficult, whether it looks good, pleasant, regardless of what it is, thank God for it and stop complaining. God allows at times difficult situations in our lives just as He did it for the children of Israel. He allowed it and He says in Deuteronomy, I have allowed it because I was testing you. I wanted to see your faith and I wanted to teach you. You see, there are spiritual lessons that we would only learn in difficult times, under stress, under heat, under pressure, and not sitting back in our couch and, and seeing some clever preacher, maybe out of Israel, preaching to you. You know, you need to at some times go through it yourself. And God allows it because He loves you. Also the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. God says, the one whom he loves, he chastises. The child, the son he loves, he chastises. So don't be surprised when you come into situations like that. And stop complaining. And start thanking God for it. The enemy is looking for the complainers and he will attack them. He will come against them. Watch out. It's dangerous. And another thing that we can learn from these, the story of the Amalekites. You see, after the children of Israel came to the land and after the time of the judges, some 350 years, came the times of the kings. And when Shaul became king, God tells him, now go and fight against the Amalekites and kill them all, even the animals. 
Don't spare anything, no sheep, no cow, no bull. Kill them all. And we remember the story, this is in 1 Samuel chapter 15, that Shaul went to this battle, he killed them all, but he spared one of them. Whom did he spare? He spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites. He didn't kill him. And he spared some of the chosen oxes. And when Samuel came to Shaul after the battle, he told him, why have you not obeyed God? And Shaul says, oh, of course I obeyed God. I went, I fought, I killed everybody. But he did not kill everybody. He did not kill the king, Agag. You see, when you obey God partially, it's like disobeying. And disobedience, Samuel tells us, is like witchcraft. It is a very bad sin before God. We need to be obedient. And so, Shaul spared Agag. Samuel killed him. He took the sword and he killed Agag. Now, look what happens when you spare the enemies of God. When you come to a point in your life as a Christian, as a child of God, as a believer, and you decide to spare, you have compassion over these things which God hates. You know what that did to Shaul? We read in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, that in the last battle that Shaul fought on Mount uh, Gilboa against the Philistines, there came the critical time where Shaul fell on his sword. He was badly wounded, but he did not die. And as he was laying there, badly wounded, he looked around and he saw a man running in the field. And he called him. Come, he said to him. And he said, who are you? And he said, I am a son of an Amal Amalekite. And Shaul told him, kill me. Because the Philistines are coming. They're drawing near and I'm afraid of them. Kill me. And this Amalekite killed Shaul. And then he took his crown and he took some of his belongings and he brought them to David. He thought he's bringing good news to David, but David was unhappy. And he told this Amalekite, because you dared to kill Shaul, who was the anointed one of God, I will kill you. And he commanded for this Amalekite to be killed. But the message for us here is, you see, Shaul spared the king of Amalek, Agag. He had compassion with him. And he died in the hands of an Amalekite. If we do not fight this which is evil, if we do not resist these things which God resists, if we do not hate the things which God hates, then these things will become a snare in our lives. And they have the danger, the potential of taking us over. We need to be very careful. We need to hate. Jesus in Revelation talks to the church of Ephesus and he, he says, Good for you that you hate the deeds of the Dinkaleuses. I hate them too. You see, we need to learn to hate this which Jesus hates and to love this which he loves. The battle against the Amalekite continued also in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 42 and 43. We read how the sons of Shimeon killed the remnants of the Amalekite. And yet many, many years later, hundreds of years later, when the children of Israel were in the exile, they were in Persia after the Babylonian Assyrian and then the Babylonian exile. Then they were, found themselves under the Persian Empire. And in the book of Esther, Queen Esther, we find Haman. And what was the name of Haman? It's called Haman the Agagite. Haagagi. And this Agagite, the name at least, is an Amalekite name. The king of Amalek was called Agag. And Haman was also called Haman the Agagite. So, and this Haman, again, wanted to destroy the whole Jewish nation. And yet God 
saved us. Even though we were in exile, even though God was angry with us, and yet we're still His children. We're still His chosen people. And He would not allow, not Haman, and not Hitler, and not Ahmadinejad, or anybody else, to fully and utterly destroy us as a nation. If we would only, as a nation, Jewish nation, come to God in true repentance, then no one would be able to touch us at all. And we would, we would take no harm from these enemies at all. So the battle against Amalek goes from generation to generation. And at the end, it is the devil that is behind this Amalek, and it's the devil that eventually will be thrown into the lake of fire when it all will come to an end. We are involved in this battle. In Revelation chapter 12, we read how we today can overcome. We've seen the battle of faith. But let's read that passage here in Revelation chapter 12 from verse 7 to 11. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon, which I say here is the devil, was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Now pay attention. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How do we overcome the devil? First of all, by the blood of the Lamb, the sacrifice of Yeshua on the cross that we're holding on to in faith, holding on to that altar on which Yeshua sacrificed himself and poured down his blood. By faith in the blood, we have victory over sin. And then it says, by the word of their testimony, we should not shrink down. I am standing here today as a Jew, as an Israeli, and I'm saying Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. Yeshua is the Messiah of the whole world. Believe in Him and you shall be saved. The word of the testimony and not to shrink back from death. We, many, many of our brothers, had to give and pay with our lives for their faith in the past. Way before there was Inquisition, and way before there was a Catholic Church persecuting the Jewish nation, we Messianic Jews were being persecuted by our own brothers. Yeshua was the first one, but there were others. Estefanos and others were stoned to death and were killed for their faith in Yeshua. And since then, countless of tens of thousands paid with their lives for their faith. Today in the Islamic world, nations, so many Christians are paying with their lives. And we have their accounts, we hear their stories, how they're being tortured to death because of their faith in Yeshua. But let everybody know, we believe in our Lord. And even if it means dying for him, we shall stand for him. And God will be with us and he will strengthen us and help us. Death is not lost for us. Death is gain and we should not be afraid of it. And dear ones, you out there in the West that will be hearing this message, that are sitting today in relatively great measure of peace and comfortable lives, the time is coming when our faith will be challenged. You need to be ready. A fire is coming on the Western world, on Western Christianity, 
This fire will burn down the grass, the dirt, the, the hay, and the straw, which is useless and worthless. And those Christians that would remain standing faithful, they shall accumulate to themselves gold purified by fire. Yeshua is not going to leave his bride the way she is today. When the corruption and dirt and sin of the world has creeped so much into the church, he is not going to leave us like that. He will cleanse us through the fire. So be ready. Be even ready to lay down your lives when the time comes. We want now to, to go back to Exodus chapter 17 to the last two verses of this magnificent passage. There is still more to be revealed, still more treasures in this passage. Let me read it for you. Exodus 17 verse 15 and 16. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, pay attention, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Let me explain. You see, Moses was on this hillside, all hilltop actually, all day long, while Joshua was fighting the battle. The victory was won. Moses builds this altar, calls it Adonai Nisi, God is my banner. And then he receives a revelation which he is sharing with us. He sees heaven open up and he sees the throne of God. And he tells us, he gives us information of what is happening up there in the unseen world. Now, the translation here is pretty good, but not completely. It says, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. But in Hebrew, it doesn't say it this way. It says, let me even read this for you for a moment. Listen to this ancient text, 4,000 years old. Listen to the Hebrew. Vayomer ki yad al kesya. And what it says in the free translation, he says, it's Moses saying, there is a hand on the throne of God. God has, has war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is very significant. You see, while Moses was holding up his hands all day long, and Joshua, not Joshua, uh, who and Aaron were supporting him on both sides. Now he says, there is a hand lifted up on the throne of God. God is seated in heaven on his throne and his hand is lifted up. Do you know that the true battle, we, we saw that the true battle was not really being waged down on earth, but we saw that there was a significant, decisive part that is taking place, was being taken place on the hilltop with Moses. But now Moses receives a revelation which tells us, hey, there is even a higher place, it's all the way up in heaven, and I see a hand raised up there. You see, it's not just we're fighting against the Amalekite down on earth, but it is God fighting in heaven against the devil who is also seated in the second heavenlies. Has his powers which are unseen. The devil who is trying to cause problems, whether it's in our individual private lives or whether it is to the nation of Israel? What was Hitler? Hitler was a demon-possessed man. He was an instrument in the hand of the devil. And his aim was to utterly destroy the nation of Israel. Because Israel has been chosen by God, the devil hates us and wants our destruction. There is a battle between God and the devil. 
and it's a history long battle. Ever since the devil managed in the Garden of Eden to cause Eve and Adam to eat from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ever since Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, ever since that time, God is fighting the devil. And God is working out his plan of salvation for mankind. And God had to make the most utterly big sacrifice of none else but his only begotten son. You know, if you remember the trial that God tried Abraham by telling him, sacrifice your Isaac. In the last moment, God held Abraham. It was on the Mount of Moriah, Har Moriah. God told Abraham, don't touch the boy. But this was all a picture of the time when God the Father in heaven, like Abraham, the Father on earth, will send his son Yeshua from heaven down to earth to be born as a baby, like Isaac was the son of Abraham. But Yeshua had to die. In the case of Yeshua, there was no one to stop the hand from going down and the knife from killing him. Yeshua had to go down to death and to the grave, all the way down. God the Father in heaven sacrificed his own Isaac. The story of Abraham and Isaac was just a picture, a shadow, a forerunner of the real sacrifice. And where did Jesus die? In Jerusalem, on Mount Golgotha. Where is it? It's right there on Mount Moriah. The temple was on Mount, built on Mount Moriah. Jesus died right there next to the temple, outside the walls. Is this a coincidence? The same place where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac? Isaac? This is where God sacrificed his own son. Is this a coincidence? No, it is not. So, what is the secret plan of God to fight the devil? It was Jesus. And where is Jesus? He is seated on the right hand of the Father. So the Word of God tells us here already in Exodus, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years before Jesus came, already He tells us, I see a hand lifted up on the throne of God. God gave Moses a revelation of his plan of salvation. He gave him a revelation of the spiritual battle, unseen battle, that was taking place in the heavenlies. The day that will come when the right hand of God, Yeshua, will smite the devil. And actually, what seemed to be the greatest defeat of Jesus when he died on the cross was his victory. Because there he paid the price for our sins. There he broke the power of sin. There he delivered us, paid the price, redeemed us, and set us free. We do not have to go to hell. We are not captives any longer of the devil, if we believe in Yeshua. He paid the price for us. He took us. He bailed us out. This picture repeats itself. Look in uh, Psalm 20, for example. You find this shadow again and again. Psalm 20, verse 6 and 7. Let me read it for you. Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed. He answers Him from His holy heaven with the saving power of His right hand. You know, where it says saving power, in Hebrew it's Yeshua. Saving, salvation is Yeshua of His right hand. Yeshua is sitting on His right hand. Salvation is on the right hand of the Father. The psalmist David tells it to us in one of the psalms and in several other places it repeats itself. This picture. In, in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 56, and also in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, 
we read about Yeshua, the Messiah, standing or sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, for His children. Also in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 10, we read the following. The Lord will lay bare His holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. You see, the time will come when even our nation will finally recognize, will see the bare hand, the right hand of God, which He calls His salvation. Who is this right hand? It is Yeshua. Today, as a nation, we don't see Him. We don't recognize Him. But the time is coming that we shall see Him and we shall recognize Him. Hallelujah. We have good hope. Now let me share with you one observation that I have made over the years. Listen to that. When you take the Hebrew original text in Exodus chapter 17, and you read this passage from beginning to end, and you count the number of times that you find the word hand or hands. When you just count it in the Hebrew, in the original text, you find that seven times the word hand or hands will appear. The first six times it refers always to human hands, whether the hands of Moses or, or or the men that were with him. It's human hands six times. But in verse 16, the last verse, where Moses sees the revelation, hand number seven is the hand on the throne of God. It's not a human hand, it's a godly hand. You know, six in scriptures is the number of men. Antichrist will be called 666. That will be his number. He's a man. Seven in Scripture is the number of perfection. And the seventh hand that Moses is telling us about is the perfect hand. It's the hand of God. It's the ultimate revelation. Seven hands. Hallelujah, this is the hand that I have chosen to believe in. As a Jew, as an Israeli, I believe in the Messiah, Yeshua, Son of David, King of Israel, Creator of the universe. There is one last treasure that I want to share with you for conclusion. You know, the last words of a person before he dies would be very significant words. We're reminded of the words of Jacob to his sons before he died, prophesying the future to them. But also the very first words that God ever gave humanity, the first written holy scripture which God gave humanity, I would say is also very significant. And what is the first written Word of God that humanity received? It's not Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. That was given later. You see this story of the battle against the Amalekite is before the experience of Mount Sinai. It's before the law was given. And it's before Moses documented and wrote everything down. This is the first time that God tells any person, write it down. And it's found in verse 14. When God tells Moses, write it down in a book, that it will be remembered. And also speak it in the ears of Joshua. And what is the message of a loving God to humanity, the very first Holy Scripture. What is the message? It's a message of destruction. Write it down and tell Joshua that I will utterly destroy the Amalekites. And you kind of wonder and say, why? Why would God, which John the Apostle calls him, 
love, he says, God is love. Why would a God which is love give to mankind such a harsh message of destruction as the very first part? Well, let me tell you, it is just because He is a God of love. And I would like to explain. You see, when God created Adam in the Garden of Eden, He didn't create him like He did the rest of creation, like He did the stars. When it was time to do the stars, He said, let there be light, let there be stars, let there be animals, let there be trees, and so forth and so forth. And it all happened because God spoke. But when it came to Adam, God didn't say, let her be Adam. No. What did he do? He formed him from ground. It was like a statue. He made him. And when you make such a statue from earth, you pay attention to every little detail, every little fold in his nose, in his ears, in his whole body. It takes attention. It takes care. It takes love to do something like that. And so God made Adam, and here he was laying. And then it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that God breathed into his nostrils life. Now, how do you do it today when a person is laying there and he's not breathing and you want to give him air? You would take your mouth, put it on his mouth, and you'd, you'd breathe into it. And that's the word in Hebrew, vaipach. You hear this word, this is when God blew air. The word in Hebrew is vaipach. Hear the explosion, vaipach. What I'm saying is, God created Adam with a lot of love, with a lot of attention. What was the first thing that Adam saw when he ever opened up his eyes? He saw his creator, right face to face, very near to him. And then God, with His love, made this wonderful Garden of Eden and placed Adam there. And after some time, He brought him the last and most wonderful surprise. He brought Eve to him. What a surprise when He opened up His eyes and He saw this most wonderful last touch of God creation, which was Eve. As wonderful as the trees were, as wonderful as the flowers were, and all the smells, and all the colors, and all the scenery, and as wonderful as all of it was, there was nothing to compare with Eve. All of this beauty was not good, because God says it is not good for man to be alone. And so He brought him Eve. You see the love of God. You see His provision. You see His care. And when then the serpent came and managed to pull down Adam and Eve, you see, God gave Adam and Eve only one test of love. He said, you know, I give you everything. You have abundance. You lack nothing. There is just one test that I give you for you to prove your love to me. And that is obey me by not eating of that one tree. Only one tree. There are millions of trees. But this one tree... Don't eat of it, because the day you eat, you'll sin. That would be disobedient, and you'll die, because I'll have to push you away from me, and I'm the source of life. And they failed, and the serpent was the one that did it. And so the broken heart of God, the painful, suffering heart of God that was longing for his creation, for his Adam and Eve. He's waiting down history. And now comes the time to write down the Holy Scripture. And the first message that he says, Moses, write it down. You see these Amalekites? They're trying to hinder you, children of Israel, from coming to the Promised Land. These powers of darkness are trying to hinder not just you, Israeli. They're trying to hinder every child that I have chosen and that I'm trying to bring to me. And that I've paid and I'm going to pay the greatest price of all I'm going to pay with my son. And yet this devil is trying to nullify my sacrifice. He's trying to avoid and to stop you from coming to me. Write it down, Moses. I am going to utterly destroy him. 
because he's standing between me and you and he's trying to stop you from coming to me. This is a message of a loving God. And we have to understand our God is love, but he's also almighty and he's holy and he's a consuming fire. He's paid the most precious price to open up the way for us to come to him. But he's expecting us to at least hold on in faith Hold on in faith to Yeshua and obey, submit, give your life to Him. Even today, wherever you're seated, if you hear this message, I want to tell you, if you have never given your life to the Lord truly, that is the time to do it now. Wherever you are, say, Yeshua, Lord, I come to you. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I come to you. In the name of your Son, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me. I invite you into my heart. And I ask you, become Lord of my life. I want to follow you. Forgive me for wandering away from you. From so many years of my life, I have been away and wasted them. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me now. Receive me. I cry to you. I give you my life. Let me tell you, Jesus, Yeshua says, I am standing at the door and I am knocking. And whoever will open up his heart, whoever will open up the door of his heart and will invite me, I will come in. It doesn't have to do with how many good deeds you have done. No. It has got to do with your faith and your decision and saying, Lord, here I am. I give you my life. And he will come because He loves you and He will wash you clean and He will give you an experience of new birth. You will start your life again with Him as a little baby that is spiritually born again. Regardless of how old you are, even if you're in your last hour in your dying bed, receive Him now. Receive Yeshua. It's not too late. As long as you're alive, you can make this decision. May God be with you may strengthen you and may always strengthen the arms of your faith to hold on to Yeshua, to hold on to the complete work which He has done on the cross for you. Hold on to the end and we shall all meet one day in heaven. God bless you. Amen. Well, hey friends, Matthew Wilson here. We truly hope that you were blessed by this marvelous teaching, and we want to remind you of a couple of things. First, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share with Pastor Daniel Yahav, or you want to just know more about the Peniel Fellowship in Tiberias, you can write to him at daniel at livingstonestv.org. We also want to remind you that you can see more rich and powerful teachings like this one by tuning into Living Stones Television each week or visiting our website to watch previous episodes or even order copies of programs like the one you've been watching. You can also sign up for our free monthly newsletter. We call it the Field Report. It provides news and insight regarding the last day's harvest in Israel, things you won't find anywhere else, and it's up to date and right on target if you want to know what God's doing today. We'd also like to ask you to prayerfully consider partnering financially with us so that we can continue to bring these wonderful and unique and much needed programs to as wide an audience as possible. We can only continue to do that by God's grace and with partners like you. Thanks for watching. Shalom.